Okay, so let's get started today with our pre-lab lecture and lab run-through of the calorimetry simulation for Chem 101. Um, so first and foremost, let's provide us a little bit of background on the theory behind calorimetry. So what is the purpose of calorimetry? Let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, so calorimetry, the goal of calorimetry is to measure the heat absorbed or produced by a reaction or physical process. Okay. So to talk a little bit about the theory behind calorimetry, let's first define the idea and let's review this idea of heat. So heat is energy exchanged between objects as the result of a temperature difference. Now, of course, we know this intuitively. You can get a sense of how heat is transferred between objects by looking at examples that we see in every day-to-day -day life. For example, if you have a hot frying pan, for example, and your hot frying pan is, suppose it's somewhere around, let's say it's somewhere around 100 degrees Celsius, so we have a hot frying pan. If we decide, if we decide to transfer to that frying pan some water, so let's suppose we're transferring over some water, and the water is at room temperature, which is 22 degrees Celsius, which is roughly room temperature. We know intuitively that when we place this water in our hot frying pan, the water is going to warm up. So if we draw out a heat transfer diagram, if we draw out a heat transfer diagram, we have our pan at 100 degrees Celsius, and we have our water at 22 degrees Celsius, and as the water is going to warm up, increase in temperature, the reason why the water warms up is that heat is transferred from the high temperature pan to the low temperature water And then at the end of this process, at the end of this process, we will end up with a pan and water at the same temperature, at the same temperature. Now, of course, the water is gonna be at a higher temperature from when it started and the pan will be at a lower temperature. When two objects in contact are at the same temperature, we call this thermal equilibrium. Okay. Now, a critical important idea behind this example is that we know intuitively that water, if you put, if you try to boil water, it takes an incredibly long time to boil water. It takes a lot of time and a lot of energy to raise the temperature of our water sample. And this is due to this idea of specific heat, or more specifically, specific heat capacity. And what specific heat measures, quite simply, is the amount of energy 
such as heat, required to raise the temperature of an object and let's be more specific here of one gram of an object by one degree Celsius. And a key feature of specific heat, a key feature of this idea of specific heat is that different substances have different specific heats. So for example, water has a specific heat value of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, where joules is a unit of energy. If we compare that with, for example, uh, a typical metal, such as, for example, aluminum, aluminum has a specific heat of around 0 0.90 joule per gram degree Celsius. Now, what, this, what these specific heat values are saying is to raise the temperature of a sample of water by one degree Celsius, we need roughly 4.184 joules of energy. Now, the larger specific heat tells us it require, we require more energy to raise the temperature of that object. Okay, perfect. Now, how can we use this? Now, how can we use this idea of heat and specific heat? So, using the law of conservation of energy, we can begin to describe the thermal energy, the heat transferred between objects. So, the law of, conser of conservation of energy simply states the total energy of an isolated system is constant. Okay, so for example, for example, suppose we have a metal block. So we have a metal block of copper at 100 degrees Celsius. Let's just suppose that for right now. And let's suppose we try to dump this metal block into a sample of water at 22 degrees Celsius. And let's now put some, some, some more definitive numbers. Let's suppose we have a 10 gram block of copper and let's suppose we have 30 grams of water, okay? So when we place our metal block, our warm metal block into the water, Okay, so here's our metal block. Here's, let's draw our water now. Now, considering our water initially, its initial temperature is 22 degrees Celsius. And for our metal block, for our metal block, our initial temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. Now, heat will flow from the high temperature object to the low temperature object until they're at thermal equilibrium. So heat is going to flow from our metal block into our water sample. So as we can see by this heat transfer diagram, we can conclude two things. One, our metal is losing heat. So the Q value will be negative. And we also know that the water is gaining heat. So its Q value will be greater than zero. 
Perfect. Now, the total energy of an isolated system is constant. So in this heat exchange process, heat is just moving from our metal block to the water. We are not creating or destroying energy. So we know that the heat lost by our metal plus the heat gained by our water is going to be equal to zero. It's going to be constant. Any heat lost by our metal is going to be gained by our water. So rearranging this equation, we know that Q metal is going to be equal to negative one times Q water. Now, we can't directly measure the heat gained or lost by our metal and our water sample, but what we can easily measure are changes in temperature. So at the end of this process, at the end of this process, after a large amount of time has passed, after a large amount of time has passed, eventually we will have our metal block immersed in water and both of these samples, both of these samples will be at the same final temperature. And we can measure temperature with a thermometer. And from our changes in temperature, we can use our specific heat or our specific heat capacities to determine the heat gained or lost by our sample. So in general, the heat gained or lost by an object is equal to the mass of an object times the specific heat or specific heat capacity of this object times the final temperature minus the initial temperature, which we call this delta T. Now, let's just suppose for a moment, let's just suppose for a moment to show how this equation would pan out in practice that our final temperature happened to be 23.0 degrees Celsius, okay. So we can write expressions and we can plug in this expression for heat for both our metal and our water sample. So for example, plugging in this equation into our expressions for heat, we get that the mass of our metal times the, the specific heat of our metal times T final minus the T initial of our metal is equal to negative one times the mass of water. Let's move over a little bit, zoom out just a little bit, times the specific heat of water times T final minus T initial water. Okay, perfect. So now we have our expression. And in today's experiment, our goal, our goal for today is because each unique substance will have a unique specific heat. Our goal today for one of our portions of this experiment is to determine the specific heat of a metal sample and identify the unknown metal using our measured specific heat using our measured specific heat. Now, in order to do that, all we have to do algebraically is solve for the specific heat of our metal. And that gives us the specific heat of our metal is equal to negative one times the mass of water times the, the specific heat of water, which we know is 4.184 joule per gram degree Celsius. The mass of water we can easily measure. And then T final minus the T initial water, 
remember the final temperature is the same for both samples, divided by the mass of our metal times the specific, well, the specific heat of our metal is, on, is what we're solving for, times T final minus T initial of our metal. The T initial of water is gonna be approximately 22 degrees Celsius and the T initial of our metal is gonna be approximately 100 degrees Celsius because we're gonna be placing our metal in boiling water to set it to a relatively consistent temperature each run. Okay, so that's our first goal. So we've applied this idea of specific heat um, and we figured out an experiment in order to determine the specific heat of our metal. So just as a run through once again, we're gonna take approximately 10 grams of our metal at 100 degrees Celsius. We're gonna place in about 30 grams of water at 22 degrees Celsius. The heat's gonna flow from our metal to the water. Since energy is conserved, any heat lost by our metal is gained by our water. We can relate the heat gained or lost by a substance to the, to the specific heat, the initial and final temperature, and the mass of an object. Substituting, since we can measure the mass of metal and the mass of water, and we can measure our initial and final temperatures, we can in turn calculate the heat gained or lost by our metal or water, and in turn, we can solve for the, the specific heat of our metal. Okay, so the only thing that we're actually measuring in this experiment are our masses and our initial and final temperatures. Wonderful, so that's the, the, that's the, the first part of today's experiment. Now let's talk about the, the second part. Let's talk about part B. And in part B, we are measuring the heat of neutralization. So what do I mean by heat of neutralization? So you're looking at the reaction between sodium hydroxide aqueous, so approximately 50 milliliters of 1.0 molar sodium hydroxide with hydrochloric acid and nitric acid. Let's look at just hydrochloric acid to start. And we're using roughly 50 mils of 1.1 molar hydrochloric acid. Okay, so when you mix strong acids and strong bases, they're going to react to generate water and sodium chloride. Additionally, we are also going to produce a lot of heat. And this heat is the result of a chemical reaction. It's the result of making and breaking bonds. Okay, so in order to measure the heat of neutralization, we're going to use a laboratory technique known as calorimetry. And more specifically, we're doing calorimetry at constant pressure. So this is quote unquote open cup calorimetry. Now that's a very fancy word for something in practice that boils down to something very simple. We are going to take a styrofoam cup. So this is an insulated cup. And we are going to mix our two solutions in the cup. So we're going to add our sodium hydroxide and we are going to add our hydrochloric acid solution into the cup. Okay, now it's really important to think a little bit for a moment and remember that both of these solutions are in water, are in water, okay? So we have both of our solutions mixed together and they're going to generate heat. So I like to think about this to help me understand heat flow. I like to pretend that I have a little box in my reaction mixture 
and I'm going to call this my reaction. Okay. So my reaction is going to generate heat. My reaction is going to generate heat in this case. Okay. And so the heat is going to flow from our chemical reaction into our water. So our reaction generates heat and our water absorbs the heat. Um, just to be a little more accurate, this, it's better to say that our solution absorbs heat. And the reason for this distinction is in many cases, the solution has a slightly different specific heat than pure water, which makes sense because there's stuff in the solution that affects how readily the, the, the solution will change in temperature in response to heat. Okay. So just like before, we can make a, we can make a, an equation that describes the total energy of this isolated system. So we're going to have a cap on it to minimize heat transfer with the outside. So we put our hydrochloric acid, put our sodium hydroxide in the cup. The chemicals will react and generate heat and our solution will absorb the heat. So then invoking the law of conservation of energy, the heat produced by our reaction plus the heat ab absorbed by our solution is going to be equal to zero. Any heat generated by our reaction is going to be absorbed by our reaction solution. So then we can now rearrange this equation to solve for the heat of our reaction is equal to negative one times the Q of solution. And we can expand out this equation. We can expand out this equation to say that the heat of reaction is equal to negative one times the mass of our solution. This is our total mass of solution. And you can get mass by taking density times volume for each of your solutions, just as a hint. Okay, times the specific heat of our solution, which is going to be approximately that of water. Check your lab manual just to make sure that there's not another specific heat that we want you to use. Otherwise, you'll use 4.184 joule per gram degree Celsius, since this is a solution in water times T final minus T initial. And we can certainly measure the temperature if we stick a thermometer into this coffee cup calorimeter. So we can, we can measure these temperatures for sure. Okay, now let's dive into how we actually measure these temperatures. So Thankfully, thankfully, this is the case. We aren't dealing with viciously reactive substances. So when you mix your solutions, when you mix your solutions, so let's suppose you mix your solutions, and you're not going to expect all of the heat of reaction to spontaneously be transferred into your water. There's no, there's no way. So as the reaction proceeds, as the reaction proceeds, we're going to have a slow transfer of heat from our reaction to the surrounding solution. However, and this is really important to keep in mind, the heat transfer is not spontaneous. And the reaction does not occur instantaneously. As a result of this, our temperature 
will increase slowly. Additionally, as this can be readily apparent from the fact that we're dealing with a coffee cup, another factor is that we also have heat escapes our calorimeter. both into the surroundings and transferred into the coffee cup calorimeter itself. Okay, so to account for the fact that the reaction does not instantaneously dump its entire heat of reaction into our solution, the reaction doesn't occur instantaneously, and the temperature is going to increase slowly, to compensate for this fact, we are going to, we will determine T final assuming instantaneous reaction by extrapolating a plot of temperature versus time in seconds. Okay, so to give you a sense of what's going on here, to give you a sense of what's going on. So we have our calorimeter, we have our calorimeter. And let's suppose initially we have our calorimeter containing our NaOH. So let's suppose we have 50.0 milliliters of sodium hydroxide at 22 degrees Celsius. Okay, wonderful. We add our hydrochloric acid, again, 50.0 milliliters of 1.1 molar hydrochloric acid. And over time, we're gonna call the time that we mixed our two objects together, T-mix. And in this time, we're gonna have it as T is equal, T is equal to, T is equal to zero. Okay, so after we've mixed our two solutions together, our temperature will increase. So our temperature will increase and increase and increase. So if we have a plot, so if we have a plot of temperature versus time in seconds, your temperature is in degrees Celsius. So initially we're gonna start at about 22.0 degrees Celsius. It's going to be a nice flat line. Nothing's changing. We finally mix our solutions together. So this is T mix. Our temperature will rise. The reactions producing heat, our water is increasing in temperature. And then eventually, whoops, and then eventually our temperature will drop. Or, as you'll see in the simulations, our temperature will sort of plateau. Now, what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to generate a linear equation of the form Y equals MX plus B, where temperature is equal to slope times time plus B for the points after the temperature has spiked and when the temperature is falling, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna extrapolate this temperature to T mix. And this is our theoretical T final. So this is the temperature assuming our reaction instantaneously occurred and transferred all of its heat to the water. So this is the T final that you're gonna be using to account for heat loss to your surroundings. Okay, so all we need to do in this experiment is mix our reagents in our calorimeter, record the temperature every five seconds or so. Once the temperature reaches its peak and starts to drop, we continue to record the temperature. Then from our plot of temperature versus time, we are going to fit a line 
to our points as our temperature drops, we're going to generate a linear equation and then extrapolate that line to the time of mixing. So in this case, we're going to plug in T is equal to zero. So your intercept for this line will be the temperature assuming instantaneous mixing. Okay. Now, once you have your T final, so Q reaction is equal to negative one times the mass of water, oh, mass of solution times the specific heat of solution times T final minus T initial. We get T final from the graph up here. T initial, we record from our initial temperature measurement from what we're mixing. And now what we can do next is we can standardize our heat of reaction and calculate what is known as the enthalpy of reaction. And enthalpy, delta H reaction, is defined as the heat of reaction over the moles that react. And my hint to you in this, in this case is you're going to need to look at your chemical equation and stoichiometry, and I need you to calculate the moles of each chemical species. And in this case, and this is really important, you're going to use the moles of limiting react not excess. You're all, you only want to, to use the moles of species that actually react because you need a reaction fundamentally to generate that heat. Okay, so make sure you're plugging in the moles of your limiting reagent, which as a hint is sodium hydroxide. Okay, and just remember you can calculate moles by taking molarity times volume. Okay, so that's our general scheme for measuring the temperature, assuming instantaneous heat transfer. Finally, for part C, we are going to measure the heat of solution. And the heat of solution, quite simply, is when you take a sample, for example, ammonium nitrate solid, which is a principal component of hot and cold packs, so ammonium nitrate, as it dissolves in water, so you're going from solid to aqueous, this process absorbs heat. If you crush a cold pack, you notice that the water is much colder. That's because as the ammonium nitrate dissolves in water, this dissolving process requires heat from the surrounding. It's an endothermic process. Okay. So what we're going to do in practice is we're going to take our solid sample. So we're going to take our solid. It may not always be ammonium nitrate. It'll be one of the solids from our simulation list. We're going to again have a calorimeter. And our calorimeter is going to contain some water. So we're going to have some water at 22 degrees Celsius. OK. We are going to transfer the solid into our water. And then at the end of our dissolving process, we are going to end up with a solution at a temperature T final. So just like before, just like before, we know that our Q for solution let's call this Q dissolving plus Q solution is equal to zero. Any heat absorbed by this physical process came from our surrounding solution, okay? So then we know that the Q dissolving is equal to negative one times Q solution. And this is where we need to be very careful. Because if we think about the two components of our solution, in our solution, 
we can really say that there's water and ammonium nitrate in our solution. So Q dissolving is equal to negative one times Q water plus the Q of ammonium nitrate. Perfect. Now all we have to do, so Q dissolving is equal to negative one times the mass of water times the specific heat of water times T final minus T initial plus the mass of solid. In this case, I used ammonium nitrate, but let's just write it as solid so that way it's more general. Okay, mass of solid times the specific heat of solid and then times T final minus T initial. Now T initial we can measure and T final just like before is determined graphically. So for example, we generate our plot of temperature versus time in seconds. So initially, initially our temperature will be very flat we mix our solutions and the temperature will drop and then our temperature will slowly rise. So we have our T mix. Again, once our temperature begins to plateau, we are going to fit a line to our data point. So Y is equal to MX plus B. And then we're gonna extrapolate to T mix, and that is our T final, assuming instantaneous reaction and heat transfer. Okay, so that's the, the theory behind this experiment. Now, just like before, we can calculate the enthalpy associated with dissolving our solid by taking Q dissolving or the, the heat of solution divided by the moles of solid that dissolves. And of course you can look up and compare your calculated enthalpy of solution to the literature enthalpy of solution. So now that we've run through the theory behind this experiment. Let's now together work on some simulations. Let's do some simulations. So uh, first and foremost, let's share, let's share our guide here. So this guide is posted on Canvas. It gives me step-by-step -step instructions on how to complete each of these simulations. So for part A, uh, you're going to want to have your lab manual open. If you're wondering where any of these values come from, they're derived from your lab manual. So first thing, we're going to do part A, which is the specific heat of a metal. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy and paste the link. Don't just click on the link. So we're going to copy and paste the link into our Chrome browser. Please use Chrome and not Safari, and you'll see the and let's now pull up the simulation. So here we go. So here is our heat transfer simulation to measure the specific heat of a metal sample. Okay, so what we're going to do first and foremost, what we're going to do is we're going to select a metal. So I'm gonna select copper in this case. It gives you the specific heat, um, but we're gonna calculate it in this experiment. I would like you to use the given specific heat just as a way of checking your work. Okay, next uh, you select a metal mass. So anywhere between 10 and 30 is fine. I'm gonna stick with 20 and you're gonna record the temperature assuming that the balance records the three decimal places. I will be checking your sig figs on your report. And as our metal has been placed in boiling water, we're gonna set the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, perfect. 
Uh, in terms of the mass of water, we're going to use 30 grams of water, and we're going to set the temperature. We're just going to set it to 20 degrees Celsius. And we're going to record the temperature, assuming our thermometer can record the temperature to two decimal places. Perfect. Now, all you have to do to start your simulation, to start our experiment, we're going to drop our piece of metal that's at, that was in boiling water that's 100 degrees Celsius into our room temperature water, and we're going to measure the final temperature of our solution. Okay? So we're going to hit start, and our temperature, of course, is going to rise and rise and rise. And eventually our temperature is going to plateau. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write down the temperatures every roughly every five seconds. So um, if you're sitting along at home, you're gonna write down the temperature every five seconds and then eventually the temperature is gonna plateau. So as we notice our temperature plateaus at around 24.6260 degrees Celsius. So you're gonna keep recording the temperature for, for about 30 seconds. And then we're gonna extrapolate to time equals zero. So in this case, since our temperatures plateaus, this is about the temperature of instantaneous mixing. So our T final is gonna be about 24.60. Um, so let's write that down in our calorimetry lab experiment. So, One moment. Okay, so you're gonna have a data table of temperature as a function of time. So this is for part A. And once you've generated your plot, it should look very similar to the plot that you see in the simulation. We see that our T final is about 24.60. Since we extrapolate this flat line back, we'll get a T, a temperature at T mix of 24.60. For the later experiments, um, and even for this first run, you're going to want to manually plot your data, and I'll be showing you an example of that when we measure the, the heat of uh, reaction and heat of neutralization. Okay. So we know that the mass of our metal, in this case, looking at our simulation, was 20.00 grams. We know that the mass of water in this simulation was equal to 30.0, well, 0, 0, 0, assuming we're measuring with the proper balance. We know that the T initial for our metal was equal to 100 degrees Celsius, and we know the T initial of our water, let's just check to make sure, was, it should be 100.00. And our T initial of our water was 20.00 degrees Celsius. Perfect. So we have all the information we need. So to calculate the specific heat of our metal, it's equal to negative one times the mass of water, which is 30.000 grams. Okay. We also know that our T final was 24.60 degrees Celsius. Let's just check one more time to be sure. Yep. Okay, so we have the mass of water times the, th the specific heat of water times T final for water, which is 24.60 degrees Celsius minus the T initial for water which is 20.00 degrees Celsius. Finally, we're going to divide by the mass of metal, which is 20.000 grams, times the final temperature of our metal, which is 24.60 degrees Celsius, 
minus the initial temperature of our metal, which is 100.00 degrees Celsius. Okay, let's now take a moment and punch this into our calculator. Let's punch this into our calculator. Let's take a moment to do that. Still punching it into my calculator, don't worry. And in the end of this calculation, we get a specific heat for our metal or a specific heat capacity of 0 0.382829 joule per gram degree Celsius. Uh, let's just check to make sure. Oh, no, 383. Sorry, because this number here will turn to 4.60, which has three sig figs. Ergo, we can only report three sig figs in our answer. Make sure to check your sig fig rules because depending on your temperature ranges and depending on the result of calculating your delta T, you'll be, you may be able to report up to four sig figs. Okay, so we completed part A. Um, you do one additional replicate run and repeat this process. Okay, so part A is taken care of. So let's now look at part B. So again, um, I'm going to go to my guide for part B and I'm gonna copy the following simulation. I'm gonna copy the following simulation. Okay, so you should, you. Okay, so let's share the simulation. Okay, so first and foremost, you're gonna to go to experiment and you're gonna click run experiment. So in this experiment, we are mixing um, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. So first for our first solution, we're gonna choose hydrochloric acid from our lab manual, we're using 50 milliliters of hydrochloric acid with a molarity of 1.10 molar. Perfect, we're then gonna hit next. And for our second solution, we are gonna use 50 milliliters of 1.0 molar sodium hydroxide. So we're gonna hit sodium hydroxide, we're gonna select 50 milliliters, and we're gonna set our molarity to 1.0. We're then gonna hit next. We're gonna hit show graph view. And then we're gonna hit start. And I want you to have a timer handy, such as from your phone. And you're gonna hit start. The solutions are gonna be mixed. And then you're gonna record the temperature given on the display approximately every three seconds. And you may have to do a few runs of this in order to get um, an adequate data set. So don't be surprised if you have to run this multiple times, it's no big deal. Now, our temperature rises, rises, and rises, and then eventually it's gonna plateau. So you're gonna keep recording this plateaued temperature for another 30 seconds. And this plateaued temperature is very, very close to our T final. So this temperature, um, unlike a real calorimeter, the temperature is not going to drop. This is perfectly insulated in the simulation. So this temperature that you see is going to be your T final, but I'd like you to collect and plot all of the data as the temperature increases and after the temperature increases to generate a valid plot just so that way you're practiced with the act of generating a plot and extrapolating your data back to the time of mixing. Okay, so let's write down, let's write down our data. Let's write down our data. So for example, 
if you're when you're doing this at home, you're gonna have the temperature in degrees Celsius versus the time in seconds. So zero seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, okay? And you're gonna take all this temperature data and let's suppose we're at the 60 second mark. Our temperature is just gonna constantly stay the same. So if we're looking at our simulation, it's 26.81. So if I wait another five seconds at the 70 second mark, it'll be 26.81, 75 seconds, 26.81, 80 seconds, 26.81. Okay, perfect. And you'll be responsible for filling in the rest of this data table on your own. Once you have this data, you're going to go in Excel and you're going to plot your temperature versus time in seconds. So your plot will look a little bit like this. And you're, you're only going to fit the data. You're only going to fit the data after the temperature begins to drop in this range right here. And since all of our data points are exactly the same after our temperature has reached its peak, so they're all temperature is equal to 26.81, you're going to end up with a line of y is equal to blank plus 26.81 degrees Celsius. And when, you're, when you plug in time is equal to zero, when you extrapolate, back to the time of mixing, you're gonna end up with a T final of about 26.81 degrees Celsius. Try making the plot to prove that to yourself for this simulation. Okay, so now that we have our T final in place, now that we have our T final in place, so our T final is 26.81, our T initial, if we look at our simulation, you look at our simulation, um, in this case, allow me to check the simulation details one more time. Ah, it says so right on the, the calorimeter containers, our T initial is 20.00 degrees Celsius. Okay, perfect. And the initial temperature is the same for both of our solutions, thankfully. So we know that Q reaction is equal to negative one times the mass of solution times the specific heat of the solution times T final minus T initial. Now, I'm going to leave as an exercise for you the process of calculating the mass of solution and the process of reading the specific heat of the solution from the lab manual. Just so that way there's a little bit of independent work. The T final and T initial are the T finals obtained graphically, the T initial just reads straight from the thermometer. And then you're going to need to calculate the enthalpy of the reaction by taking the heat of the reaction over the moles of the limiting reagent. Because remember, it's the heat per mole of chemical, mole of compound that actually reacts. 
So I'll leave that as an exercise for you to tackle on your own. Let's now discuss part C. Let's now discuss part C. So just like in part B, you're going to need to create a table of temperature versus time in seconds. So five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And thankfully, if we follow my instructions exactly, you'll have a wonderful plot in the simulation to check your work. So let's go to part C. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy the URL link and we're going to open up and paste it into our browser. You, you need to have um, JavaScript enabled on your computer. Okay, so we should see the following simulation pop up. So let's pull that up. So here's the simulation. So what we're going to do first and foremost is we're going to select a solid. I'm going to pick ammonium nitrate in this case. Now, in term based, if we read from our lab manual, we're going to need about five grams of solid. So let's move the slider to five grams. And you're going to record the temperature, assuming your balance records the three decimal places. For the volume of water, we're going to stick with 20 mils. We're all good to go. So now, now that we're ready, we're going to hit start and we're going to dump our solid into the water and it will, it will generate a plot of temperature versus time in seconds. And you're gonna to wanna to read the data from this plot and generate your own plot of temperature versus time. Once you have this plot of temperature versus time, let's annotate. What you're gonna do is you're gonna fit data in this range here y is equal to mx plus b. So you're gonna highlight only the data in this range and you're gonna make a linear fit. Oops. Okay, so let's resume where we left off. I apologize for the abrupt cutoff. The computer crashed due to an error with the writing software. So let's resume now and let's pick up where we continued on for part C of this experiment. So as a recap, we select our solid, in this case, ammonium nitrate. Now we adjust the mass of solid to five grams. We keep the volume of water at 20 milliliters and then we hit start. The simulation will process and will record the temperature as a function of time. You're gonna record the temperature approximately every three to five seconds. And once you have a plot of temperature versus time, you're going to extrapolate the data after the temperature has begun to plateau back to the time of mixing. So as we see here, our T mix is somewhere around nine to 10 degrees Celsius. You're gonna need a more exact Excel plot to get a more exact final T mix or T final temperature reading. So it's about 8.33 degrees Celsius. So let's now write down that information. Let's write down our approximation. So we knew that our T initial was about 20.00 degrees Celsius and our T final is about 8.32 degrees Celsius. Again, you're going to have to be able to generate your own plot of temperature versus time. So we'll have our temperature and time. So as we discussed earlier, your temperature will drop and then eventually it will plateau out. What you're going to do is you're gonna take the data points after the temperature begins to, after the temperature begins to plateau and you're gonna extrapolate, one moment, and then you're gonna extrapolate the temperature back, oops, one moment. This curve is not 
quite reflective what you'll see. So the temperature will drop and then it will slowly begin to rise. And what you're going to do is you're gonna extrapolate your plot back to t equals zero, which is your t mix, which is equal to t final. So in this case, our T final is approximately 8.32 degrees Celsius, um, but you're gonna need to plot your data to get a more exact value. Now, if you, as you repeat aspects of this experiment, I would suggest trying with different solids. So we hit the reset button and we can try with, for example, uh, sodium hydroxide and hit start. And depending on the exact identity of the ionic solid, you'll observe very different enthalpies of solution. For example, sodium hydroxide has a pretty exothermic enthalpy of solution and it's even trailing outside of the graph. Okay, perfect. So now we have our complete overview of each of the simulations and every aspect of the experiment. Uh, in, in terms of calculations, in terms of calculations, so we know that the Q for dissolving is equal to negative one times the mass of water times the specific heat of water times T final minus T initial plus the mass of solid times the specific heat of solid times T final minus T initial. And you'll get the specific heat of the solid from the lab manual. And the T final is obtained graphically. Once you have the heat associated with dissolving your solid, you're then gonna calculate your enthalpy for dissolving your solid or the enthalpy of solution. And the way that you calculate the enthalpy of solution is you take the heat of solution, the heat associated with dissolving your solid and divide it by the moles of solid dissolved. And from there, you're able to report the heat of solution or the enthalpy of, and the enthalpy of solution. Okay, so that's our complete run through of each of the components of the calorimetry experiment. If you have any questions when performing this experiment, I'll be available via Zoom during the scheduled lab time for this calorimetry lab. With that, that's the end of today's experiment. And make sure after completing this lab, you record your data diligently in your report sheets and you answer any questions found at the end of your lab manual. Okay.